Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Lamb, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. 26 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one advising services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Success 3 E-Commerce, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network. Please mark your calendars for the next webinar in our digital boot camp series, Mobile Apps, How to Plan, Execute, and Launch on July 16th. I'll drop the registration link in the chat momentarily. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted and the chat feature is turned off. But if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box and we will adjust them at the end of the session. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session, Cameron Nelson, CEO of Tenzing Startup Consultants. Cameron has over 19 years of experience in technology and as a senior tech consultant in Silicon Valley helping Fortune 500 companies improve their digital marketing and e-commerce. At the same time, he also founded several tech companies, including a software as a service website for tree preservation and a blockchain platform for nonprofits. Cameron is accomplished in language, culture, has an MBA and MA. He believes new technology products have the ability to help shape our world for the better. Please join me in welcoming Cameron Nelson. Thanks for that introduction. And hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session on e-commerce. I'm going to be taking a high-level view of some of the major e-commerce platforms that you can be selling your products on, as well as looking at what kind of website strategies you should employ to maximize your sales online. And new to this month's session on this topic is some information about how AI has been changing the landscape for e-commerce and how major e-commerce platforms are using AI and helping you bam, get the most out of that technology for your business. Um, this presentation will last about 45 or 50 minutes, and then after that, we'll have time for your questions. So please feel free to jot down your questions as we go, or you can type them into the uh, Q&A box as you think of them, and we will get through as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So with that, let's jump right into it. We have three goals for the bootcamp today. The first one is to learn what website type and e-commerce platform will work best for you and your business. Secondly, I'm gonna show you how to set up your e-commerce store and list your items for sale. And third, I'm gonna talk about strategies on how to refine your store and be able to maximize your profits over time. The first thing I want to cover is your website. So this is going to be something like yourbusiness.com. If you don't already have a website for your business that sells online, or if you're creating a new business that's focused on selling online through e-commerce, then I highly recommend you will consider having a website. Um, there's four different types of websites that kind of range in complexity and expense. And I'm going to go through the four different types here so you get an idea of what level you're at currently if you have a website right now, or if you don't have a website, what level you need to be at and what kind of expense you might incur to build that type of website. And this is because having your own website, your .com is an integral part of your online selling strategy. It gives you kind of a home on the internet in addition to selling on e-commerce platforms, which we'll talk more about. And it can give your brand and your product a higher quality and a higher image and brand reputation online to allow you to sell your products for a higher profit margin. The first type of website is a very basic level website. Um, this is going to have no e-commerce shopping capabilities. And what that means is there won't be products for sale that somebody can buy with a credit card. But this can work if your business is more of a service-based business, like a hair salon or something that you have a physical location where people come in to get the service and they don't need to buy anything to do that. With that type of business, level one website can work for you. However, moving up to a level two website, 
will give you links to pages where you list your products. And again, these can be a physical product that you're selling and shipping, or it can be a product uh, that's a service you're selling that somebody's going to buy online. But you're going to link to an external website, an e-commerce site, to actually complete the checkout purchase. So this means you don't have to process credit cards or anything like that on your website. If you want to take credit cards on your website, then a level three or robust level website is where you need to be looking. Because this will integrate the shopping capabilities and the payment gateway information right onto your website. So this means they don't have to go to a third party site like Amazon to buy the product, helping you increase your brand reputation, kind of have a better brand and purchasing experience, make your whole business look more professional. And with this type of website too, you can also do some more advanced things like you can have feeds to your social media pages or other things that can help you sell online. And lastly, a level four or advanced level website is going to have the most advanced shopping capabilities, such as video reviews of your products, um, referral packages, if you want to have that, or even sell subscription packages to your services, whether they're monthly or annual. You can enable all those types of e-commerce selling features with an advanced level website. So if you already have a website and you want to invest in upgrading that, or maybe you're starting with no website right now, and you want to know what it's going to take to get to the level you think you should be at, here are some considerations to upgrade your website. Firstly, if you don't have any website, you can start with a basic website, usually for free. And you can get these from sites like Wix.com, Squarespace.com, and Weebly.com are some of the more popular options. And also, if you're going to sell your products on e-commerce platform, such as Shopify, Etsy, or Amazon, they're going to offer you the ability to set up your store page and kind of customize that a little bit. But this is not going to be as good as a full domain name, you know, yourbusiness.com. It's not going to give you that same brand image. It can be a short-term measure for some, and it's definitely the cheapest option and sometimes completely free. However, if you're going to be serious about selling online, a level two website is really the minimum you should be considering probably because it's going to allow you to customize your website with a lot more information and make it more personal to the market that you're selling to. You'll also be able to link to third-party sites such as the Shopify, Etsy, or Amazon, or others to sell your products. So they will handle the credit card transactions for you you will end up paying them more money for that service. So this can work for some businesses, but it's not gonna work if your business is growing rapidly or if you have more complex needs to sell your products, like you wanna have a subscription package or anything complex about the checkout process, minimum level website won't really get you there. For that, I would recommend a level three or robust level website. These are often an investment around two to $9,000 and will allow you to target your market with much greater customization. So you can have different marketing campaigns or ad campaigns online that can go to different landing pages, uh, do things like A-B testing, and really dial in the effectiveness of your website and sell, you know, have a higher conversion rate on your website of people buying your products with a level three. And lastly, a level four website is necessary when you have something that's more complex to sell. So if you're selling something that comes in lots of different sizes, shapes, or configurations, you might need to invest more money in an interface that helps people find those products that they're looking for. You can expect to spend between eight and $45,000 or even more on these types of advanced websites, depending on what your features are that you need to sell your products. So I want to talk a little bit more about the costs of running and maintaining any of these types of websites. For any business, this is really an essential part of the business operating plan and the expenses is expending and maintaining your online presence. So with the hosting fee is a $20 a year fee for your domain name. This is pretty common across the board. Some domains you'll see are more money and some are less. The average is about $20 a year. And in addition to that, you'll spend some money on website hosting. And what this means is it's the computer somewhere in the world that's storing your website images and text and serving those up to people when they visit your website. 
Most basic website plans start at around $50 per year for website hosting. A minimum level website is around $100 a year. Robust is about $150, and advanced is about $250 a year. And this is because you have, as a more complex website has more files, more pages, more images, and all those things take more bandwidth, and you do end up paying more for that. The next expense I'd highly recommend you consider is having a nice email address at your domain name. So this would be something like info at or contact at yourbusiness.com. The cheapest email at your domain name that I've ever found is about a dollar a month or $12 a year. And you can get this at Zoho, Z-O-H-O dot com. However, if you're going for a level three or four website, I suggest you would invest in a better email address, which is I think the one on Google which means you have the same Gmail interface you're used to with any personal Gmail addresses that I think is really good, really powerful. And you also get all of the access to the Google apps, like the calendar and Google Meet um, and Google Sheets and all those online tools to help you really maintain and manage your business. The next expense are paid ads. So if you're gonna build a great website and you're gonna be selling your products, you're gonna want a way for people to find that website and paid ads are one of the primary ways businesses can do that. Now, if you only have a basic level website, in most cases, I would recommend you don't invest in paid ads because the website is probably pretty bare bones. I would instead suggest you first recommend you invest in upgrading your website to a higher level. But if you already have a level two website, minimum budget is about $1,200 a year for an effective ad campaign to help you draw more visitors to your website. A robust level website, you can expect to spend around $3,000 a year. And an advanced level website for businesses that can support and maintain that type of website and has that revenue, they often spend $10,000 a year or more on their online marketing and paid ads. The next expense is the development cost. So I think everybody here in the meeting today can set up a, a level one or even a two website on their own. The platforms make it very easy to do. You don't need experience coding. You do need um, the attention and the time to invest in learning a little bit about the platform you choose. So probably five or 10 hours will do it. But if you want to hire a professional developer, these are some of the costs you can expect to spend. A level one a website is around $300 to $1,000. Level two is $750 to $3,000. A level three website can range between two and $9,000. And a level four website can range from eight to $45,000 or more, depending on your features. And the last expense you might, ex you might need to pay is for what's called SSL, which is a secure encryption between credit card information entered on your website and those credit card processing networks like Visa, MasterCard. A level three or four website will need this because you're going to be taking those credit card payments on your own website as opposed to a third-party site. So you'll expect to spend around $100 a year for SSL. So these are the main expenses setting up and maintaining your website. Just so you're aware and you kind of can budget for that depending on what phase your business is in. So now that I've talked about the different types of websites, hopefully you have in your mind what level you should be at. Now, again, this website that we just discussed is kind of your business's home on the internet. Now, many small business owners decide to sell their products on their website in addition to one of the e-commerce platforms listed here. We're gonna talk about these five in some detail. They are the largest e-commerce platforms in the world and they all have some pros and cons. And I hope that you get an idea of which platform or platforms are going to be best for you to sell your products on after we go through these. And again, if you have any questions about anything covered, feel free to ask me at the end. So the first one up is Shopify. Shopify offers um, a great, you know, all round experience. Their price is pretty much in the middle of the pack. They are between nine and $79 per month. And depending on what, what level of a package you need, you know, what you're trying to sell, essentially, if you want to sell subscriptions on a monthly basis, you end up paying more. They also have a, a transaction fee for credit card processing that's between zero and 2%. And the 0% comes in if you use their payment processing gateway. 
and I'll explain more about what that means at the end of the presentation. Shopify is extremely easy to set up. You don't need any experience setting up a website or even selling online. They make it very user-friendly. But I think one of the downsides to be aware of is they don't allow you to customize the checkout process very much, at least not compared to some of their competitors. The next one is Etsy. Etsy charges a 6.5% transaction fee and a 20 cent listing fee per item and plus a 3% payment processing fee. And they're focused on handmade and handcraft supplies. They're also very easy to set up and post products on just like Shopify. So no prior experience is necessary at all for that. The third one here is also the newest. This is called Facebook Shops. Now, Facebook Shops is not the same as Facebook Marketplace. If any of you have used Facebook Marketplace, that's more of a place where people will sell a one-off item, maybe used items. But Facebook Shops is really meant for bulk sales of, of the products your business is selling. So they let, let you track inventory and set up shipping rates and all those things, just like Shopify and Etsy. Facebook Shops charges a 5% sales fee or a 40 cent fee for items that ship uh, for $8 or less. They're geared towards small businesses and merchants. And one of the biggest advantages of Facebook Shops is that Facebook has over 2.5 billion users, which means a ton of organic search traffic for your products that are listed on Facebook Shops. Also, Facebook Shops integrates very well with Instagram. It's a relatively new thing, and I'm gonna talk more about that later. But if somebody sees an image of, say, a purse or a ring or a doll collar on Instagram, Facebook uses an algorithm to see who's selling that product, and they can then click on something they want to buy in an image, and they might find their way to your Facebook shop store and buy that from you. So that's a pretty cool thing that Facebook and Instagram do. Next is Amazon, who I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Amazon is the world's largest e-commerce platform. Their fees are $1 per item or $40 a month, plus a fulfillment fee that can range between $2 and $6. Now, one nice thing about Amazon is that they do offer to warehouse and store your items and ship them for you. They can also do things like handle your returns for you. Um, so they, if you want them to do these additional services, they do charge a higher fulfillment fee. But many businesses find it just very convenient to send Amazon, let's say, a, a pallet of a thousand of the same thing let Amazon sell them and distribute them around the country as needed. And uh, and it's just a time saver, Is but you do pay Amazon for that service, but a lot of people like it. I do think the Amazon website is the best if you're selling things that are a bit more complex, like they come in multiple sizes, colors, textures. Maybe it's you know shoes that come in different sizes and colors or whatever it may be. Amazon offers probably the best experience to help your customer find the right product they're looking for. And lastly is Amazon Handmade, which is a niche part of Amazon that was created to compete really with Etsy. Amazon Handmade has no monthly fee at all, but they do have a 15% fee on all of your sales. They do allow you to have the same ex great Amazon experience with really good search features and ways that customers can find the size and configuration of the product that they're looking for. However, it's not guaranteed that you can even get in to sell on Amazon Handmade because there's an artisan application you have to submit. And I went through this process with several businesses and involved multiple emails asking for information, a phone interview, and even a video interview. And the whole process took at least a month. So expect to go through some of this process with Amazon Handmade, but if you get approved, then you're in more of a small elite category of like artisans, and you can generally sell your product at a higher price point here than these other e-commerce platforms. So now that I've gone through and done a quick overview of these five platforms, I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into them. So by the end of the next few slides, you have an idea of which platform or platforms you think would work best for your business. First is Shopify. You know, they build themselves as being the global e-commerce platform and that you can build your business with Shopify to sell online, offline, and everywhere in between, they say. So Shopify does offer an offline credit card swiping machine 
that's tied conveniently to your inventory and your account online. So if you're the business kind of business that would like to sell physically and maybe at farmers markets or you have a store and also sell online, you can use Shopify as a one-stop place for your credit card processing, your billing and payment history, and all of that. So some of the reasons why I think Shopify is a great choice, it is very easy to use. It's aimed at people with no prior experience selling a product online. They own their own payment processing network. So what that means is that if you do use it, you pay 0% of the credit card processing fees. But don't feel too excited because, of course, Shopify does make up for what they lose there in other fees they charge. So it probably all evens out. But they are unique in that sense. It's scalable. So you can have thousands of different products for sale on Shopify. Um, it's meant for small businesses that want to grow bigger. Now you will end up paying more fees as you grow bigger and want to list more products, but it is scalable, which is nice. And they have a big marketplace for apps. So if you have a Shopify site and you want to add in some maybe video reviews or other type of feature, there's going to be a marketplace where you can quickly find some quick apps that can fulfill some of those needs. And this is a relatively new feature of Shopify, which a lot of people find pretty handy. Another unique feature of Shopify is that they're the only major platform that helps you create an NFT, which stands for a non-fungible token. So if any of you have heard of blockchain or cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, NFTs are part of that ecosystem. And if you're selling something that's a digital product, so music, images, videos, anything that is going to be distributed digitally online, then an NFT is one way to sell that. It basically creates a unique sellable token that represents your creation, and it can only be owned once. So no two co you cannot ever copy an NFT, essentially. And Shopify allows you to create these NFTs from your digital work and sell them. So it's a pretty cool feature. If you're at all interested in learning more, uh, check out shopify.com slash NFT and they make it very easy to create these NFTs and sell these NFTs on Shopify. The next platform we'll look at is Etsy. Etsy is really focused on niche markets like arts and crafts and home decor. Some of the categories they have listed on the, their website, outdoor entertaining, you know, glassware, leather, wedding gifts, and things like that. So if you're selling things in these categories, Etsy can be a logical choice because people are already coming to Etsy looking for handcraft and handmade items. So it's got that niche market focus. Etsy is also very easy to set up your storefront, very much like Shopify. It's got the built-in audience, like I said, because Shopify is a very generic platform. You can sell everything from shoes to antiques to you know glassware, whatever you want to do. But Etsy is really focused on arts and crafts um, and unique handmade items. And Etsy offers really helpful seller tools that you have access to to help you kind of gauge what types of products are trending most, where you might be able to sell the most products in, and they give you some measurements and dashboards to help you see that data and make the best decisions of what you want to sell and even what price to sell it at. Next up is Facebook Shops. This is obviously integrated very closely with Facebook. So if you already use Facebook for your business and you're active on posting there, then Facebook Shops can be a logical place to extend into and to list your products for sale. However, if you're not a fan of Facebook and you don't use it, then you might want to avoid this uh, option because it does ask you to really give up a lot of your data to Facebook and they'll use that and sell that data uh, however they want to profit from it. So that could be a one downside of Facebook is they don't have a great reputation with user privacy and user data. But some of the pros are, it gives you this direct access to over 2.5 billion users, like I said, has a really nice integration with the Instagram platform, which they own. And you can really customize how your Facebook shop store looks with your logo and some colors and fonts. Now it's not as good 
as your own website would be as far as, far as customization, you know, your business.com. That is the ultimate form of personalization of your brand online. But Facebook shops does a pretty, pretty good job of helping you do some of that, you know, and sell on their site. It also gives you a lot of analytics and data and insights into trends. And because they have access to so much user data, they are a very powerful platform if you want to get into the analytics and see um, how that can inform your selling decisions and what price point you can sell your products at. Facebook does a great job with showing you a lot of data and helping you make those tough choices. Fourth site here is Amazon. It is the largest e-commerce platform in the world. And some of the main points are it really does have the massive customer base. It offers the fulfillment services, like I mentioned. You can warehouse your items here at Amazon. They will distribute them to warehouses around the country kind of automatically based on a lot of data they collect and where those are going to be sold. So they do a lot of the grunt work for you, though it does get quite expensive. Um, a lot of Amazon users are Prime users, so they get shipping for free. So your, your items can be shipped uh, for free to the users if they're Prime, which is a great selling point. And they have a lot of good advertising tools. So if you want to run an ad on Amazon, as I'm sure we've all seen these from time to time, you can pay Amazon to have your product in an ad placement. And those generally get a lot more clicks and a lot more purchases. I think the biggest downside to Amazon is probably the risk of fraud and counterfeits. There's a lot of examples of small, medium, and large companies and products being uh, counterfeited on Amazon. And then the counterfeiters are never brought to justice. They're never shut down by Amazon. Amazon doesn't really have a good policy for enforcing anti-counterfeiting measures. So one example is I worked with a pasta company in Virginia a couple of years ago who was selling handmade dried pastas on Amazon. They were selling over $100,000 a month of product. And after five or six months of doing very well, they realized their sales had fallen off a lot. And they did some research and found there was an there's an identical brand that copied their logo and their box look and very much copied the product. And it was selling under an almost identical name and taking a lot of their business. Um, so they contacted Amazon multiple times and Amazon basically didn't do anything about this. So they had to stop selling on Amazon and shift to selling on their website, which took months and they lost a lot of money and a lot of sales just because of this unexpected hiccup in their operations. So it is a risk if you sell primarily on Amazon, uh, Amazon won't really help you as the merchant, uh, deal with these issues. So if you're small, it's probably not a problem because it's only when companies start getting bigger that a counterfeit operation will look to see who they can copy and how they can make some money. So you might start on Amazon, but have an exit plan to transition off as soon as you can, you know, to your own website primarily. So you can really ensure the quality of the, uh, the experience and, and maintain the integrity of your brand. Now, the last platform here is Amazon Handmade. And here are some reasons why Amazon Handmade really stands out to me. It gives your brand, we were talking about that integrity that Amazon kind of lacks. Well, they're trying to make up for that because they have this involved application process for Amazon Handmade. So generally speaking, people who get on here and businesses that sell here are legitimate. Also, they're prime eligible for that prime shipping. There's no listing fees, as mentioned, but there's that a flat 15% sales fee. And they offer the fulfillment services, so you can warehouse and stock your items all with Amazon. And some of the categories they're helping people sell would be things like jewelry, home decor, kitchen and dining, beauty products and pet products, as well as many other things. So if you're selling those types of products, I think Amazon Handmade can be a really good logical place for you to sell them on. So now that we've talked about the different e-commerce platforms that you can consider, I hope you have in your mind one or maybe multiple platforms that you think stand out to you as good choices for your business based on what you sell and how you want to sell it. So now we're going to talk about how do you set up your e-commerce store? How do you find your products to sell? How do you customize your e-commerce template or that starting look of your e-commerce page? And how do you add your products the right way?
So how do you find your products to sell? You should first ask how many products do you plan on selling online? If you're new to e-commerce, um, you might have a large inventory. I've dealt with businesses that had thousands of items in their you know, brick and mortar store, and they started going down the long road of trying to list them all on e-commerce. That's generally not the best approach because it takes a lot of time to get all those text descriptions, the images, get them organized, get them uploaded, and of course, keeping them maintained and updated. So I would start by listing 10 or maybe 20 items at first in the first month or two, see how well they sell and kind of learn from what you've the data you've gathered and what's sold the boat the most and sold the worst to help inform your future decisions of new products to list. And when you're looking at what products to list, ask yourself these questions. Does it solve a customer pain point? And generally, the bigger the pain and the problem it's solving, the more valuable it is and the better it's going to sell online. Does it appeal to an enthusiast or hobbyist crowd? Because Etsy or Amazon Handmade can be logical places to find those types of buyers. Does the product go with your personal passion and build on your own experience? Because you need every advantage you can get. It's very competitive selling online. So if you have um, experience in a certain field or with a certain product that gives you knowledge that people other people don't have, it's going to really help you sell your product. Does it capitalize on trends early? So always be on the lookout for trends. And if you can sell a product in that area, it will sell much better. And some ways to find trends is you can read customer reviews on existing products, the good reviews, but also the cons and to see what customers are saying they don't like. You can then get ideas about products that maybe you have a product or you can adjust your one of your products to help solve that customer complaint and pain point even more. Litmus test before you launch just means don't go and list 100 items for sale that are all very similar in the same category because that might be a lot of time spent on little return. So it's better to spread out your efforts across multiple categories, kind of a broad selling approach, and then see what is selling the best, um, You know who your products are targeting in the market. Maybe there's something that's really hot the next few months. And you want to have a broad base of selling so you can identify those trends. And then you can kind of double down in that category and list more items for sale there. Some helpful things you can do are to browse what's trending in online marketplaces to get some ideas. Amazon tells you what's the number one best-selling item in many categories. This changes daily. So just by browsing Amazon, you can see some of the trending items. There's other third-party websites that also you know, analyze this data and present you with some findings. One that I have used in the past and a lot of people like is called camel, camel, camel. It's just like the name of the animal three times, uh, camel, camel, camel.com. And this website looks at Amazon and, and the other major e-commerce platforms and pulls out best-selling items, price, you know, price fluctuations, all sorts of interesting things. So you can go here and look and get some ideas for products. Now, because selling online kind of reduces your product to a commodity, it's very hard to see the quality difference of your product and a competing one when you're just looking at a text description or even pictures. So you're probably going to need to sell, is try to sell products that have a higher profit margin right off the bat because you might have to lower your prices to be competitive. And if your profit margin starts too low, you might end up just reducing your margin to close to nothing. So it wouldn't make it worth your while. And lastly, always be on the lookout for new trends and opportunities because your competitors are certainly going to be doing this. And to stay competitive online, it's a constant um, kind of journey of learning of the trends and selling to them. So next, we're going to talk about how to customize your e-commerce template. So if you pick, say, Shopify, Etsy, Amazon, or Facebook, they're going to give you a starting layout for your page. And you can often pick multiple different starting layouts. And you can adjust your store's design then to suit your brand and what you're trying to sell. And when you're looking at the different templates and layouts, ask yourself a few questions. What features do you want your store to have? What style of home page do you want? Do you want it to be very colorful and have lots of photos and images, or maybe you want it to be more streamlined and minimalistic, you should think through what your target market will like the most and what will resonate with them. Always put yourself 
in the buyer's shoes and try to design your experience and your store and your website to talk right to them. And how do you want your customers to move around your store? Do you want them to, again, have all your pages on the, all your products listed on the home page, or do you want to have sub pages and subcategories? Think about how that will work the best. Once you've picked your starting template, you can customize many aspects of it, like the text size and the fonts, the colors, the images, of course, you can re replace any default ones with your own, move around the positioning. You can have features of products, images, and text, and always you can embed your social media links. Now, this is a good idea because often a buyer online won't just buy a product the first time they see it. Uh, they might hold off. They might do a little bit of research on the company, see what the reviews are like. So by embedding social media, if you're active on any platforms, it makes it even easier for your prospective customer to say, okay, I want to see you know, if there are people on their Facebook page, if they like their certain products and services, or if they're complaining about them. So they can click on your Facebook page. They can hopefully read your latest posts, see the comments, and then get some confirmation that you're a good, legitimate company and they want to buy your product. So putting the social links there helps to just expedite that process. Now, when you go to add your products, there's a few things you're going to need to have ready for all of them. First one is the name, of course. Second is the price you want to sell it at. Third is the category. You also will need the weight for any physical products you plan on selling and shipping. And that file for anything digital. Even if that's an NFT, you'll still need that file. So there's three th key things to have a great product on their website or e-commerce platform. That's gonna be the product descriptions, the images, and putting in the right product categories so it can be found. Now the product descriptions, they need to be convincing and speak right to the audience and helping to solve their pain point, but there's definitely some things to avoid. Avoid any complex jargon and avoid abbreviations. You can't assume everybody is in your industry and knows what an abbreviation might mean, so always spell out any abbreviations. Avoid using cliches because they don't really add any value and avoid long sentences. Uh, research done of the best-selling items on Amazon a couple of years ago showed a common pattern in the length of the product descriptions. And this is still holds true today. Uh, they were between three and five sentences of text in a paragraph form, followed by about four to six bullet points of additional description. So keep that in mind, some sentences of text a few bullet points, and that's it. The images or videos can also illustrate other features of the product. Very few people will have the attention span to read half a page or a page of text of a product description, but I see this all the time when people launch into e-commerce stores, they go in with way too much tech. So again, minimal text is better. Tell the story in images or videos if you can, and that will help you sell your product more frequently. So how do you take the best product images? Images are really important when selling your product. They're going to help differentiate your product's quality from the competitors. So here's some tips on how to take great product images. The picture here on the left is a photography light box. And this is a simple setup you can buy online for 20 or $30. It consists of a, a white space with a neutral white background and an even lighting source. So there's no dark shadows or distractions on the products you're taking photos of. And then all you do is you set a camera, which can be your phone in many cases. If it's a modern smartphone, it'll take probably decent photos for this or a more dedicated DSLR professional camera. You set it on a tripod and you'll take your images at the same angle with the consistent lighting. So it's really key to have some sort of a setup similar to this to take your good, good product images. In addition to using a setup like this, here's a few other tips. You, of course, always want to use a high quality image when selling online. So if somehow an image got resized, really small in resolution, and now it looks blurry, don't use that image. It's going to give a bad impression to your target buyer, and it will really decrease the likeliness of them purchasing your product. Make sure each image is the same size. So you want them all to be the same aspect ratio, you know, either landscape or portrait mode. 
you want them to have the same um, resolution and dimensions, ideally. So again, if you take them all from a phone camera or DSLR, they'll probably be all the same out of the right off the out of the beginning. But if you're taking them on multiple devices, you might run into an issue where they're of different sizes or qualities. So make sure that they're the same before you upload them. Some of the e-commerce sites I mentioned have a 360 degree view option, which can help customers see the back of your products, which can be really helpful in some cases. If your product would benefit from this and you're uploading the images to say Shopify, then it'll, the platform will walk you through how to take multiple images around in a 360 degree pattern and it, it'll stitch those together to make that experience on your website. Also make sure every product variation image. So if it comes to different colors and patterns, make sure you have an image of every option so they can know exactly what they're gonna get. And some products benefit greatly from being able to zoom in to see some details. Maybe it's needlework or pottery or something like that. In those cases, you'll need a higher resolution image to support being able to zoom in. And the website you're uploading it to, that e-commerce platform, will guide you through the requirements of what size of an image you need for that. And the last thing is, if you take an image from a smartphone or a DSLR camera, it's probably going to be rather large in megabytes, probably between five and even 10 megabytes in size. That's a really huge file to be putting online. You don't need that much detail in a photo for an e-commerce site. And in fact, having too many photos of that size just really slows down the loading of your site. So you can optimize or shrink those images in the file size by using a free online image compression tool. Um, so this will reduce that file size. And what I recommend is you reduce it down to about 200 kilobytes or maybe 300 kilobytes at the most, uh, which is a drastic reduction from five or 10 megabytes. So make sure you shrink your photos. Don't ever upload a bunch of five megabyte photos because it will make your website load slowly, which will not only make it frustrating for people on slow internet connections, but it will also hurt your website search engine optimization score which I don't talk a lot about SEO or search engine optimization in this meeting, but it's an important part of getting free visitors to the website. And so you don't want to have large images because that will reach your score there and let you get few web visitors to see your products. So now we talked about some of the strategies of taking product photos. Here's some examples of good product images. A thing like a mention image, full of trying to show the relative size and scale of the product. A comparison chart can be handy. You're trying to compare the product to your competitor. You're highlighting what your differentiating factors are and what to buy your. Hello, everyone. Um, Cameron will be right back. He's having some technical difficulties with his internet, but he said if he dropped off, he would be back in one moment. So um, we apologize, but if you can just hang tight for a moment, he should be right back with us. Thanks.
Okay, I'm sure he's trying his hardest to get back on here. Um, just so you all know, this is being recorded, so you will get a copy of this. Um, so if for any reason, you, oh, here he is. But I said, at any point, if you need to drop off, you'll have a full recording at the end. Hi, Cameron. Yes, I'm back. Sorry Welcome about back. the interruption, everybody. Okay. Yeah, just a brief internet hiccup, but I'll jump back to where we were. Great, thanks. So I was just talking about the different types of example product images. Uh, the next one we have is a 3D image mixed with an infograph. This is really helpful when you're trying to show what's inside of your product, if it's not visible on the outside and why your product is unique and different from your competitors. And in addition to these three types of images you can have created by a graphic artist, Here's some good examples of product images that you can take yourself. So you can use the photography light box example like I showed. You can take images also showing the creation process. People really like to see how the products are crafted. Uh, you can show them to scale. So in the case of jewelry or something where the scale is important, go ahead and show them on a hand or show them on a body like this. And if you have products that are all very similar, you know, they just have a different name. You can take a group shot of multiple products like this and kind of alleviates the need from taking individual pictures of very similar products. And you can just use this group shot on multiple product pages because the products are going to be in that shot. Now, one thing that's emerged as a trend in 2024, especially is sustainability and selling via e-commerce. And so I've included some information about that to help you make informed decisions about how you can be sustainable and how it influences your customer behavior. So 46% of customers say they're more likely to purchase from companies that support environmental or even social causes, which indicates a strong preference for the brands with sustainable practices. And companies that demonstrate a commitment to sustainability, they can influence customer choices and they can promote a more positive brand image and more customer loyalty. So what are some things you can do to capitalize on this trend and make this a part of your selling online? You can start by implementing sustainable practices. With ethical sourcing, you can ensure that all the materials you use are responsibly sourced and emphasize to your customer the reduction of environmental impact by buying your products over your competitors. You can ship your products in eco-friendly packaging and use things like biodegradable or recyclable packaging to minimize waste. And in your manufacturing of the products, you can choose processes that reduce carbon footprints and promote green energy efficiency. And all of these things can be communicated to your customers in the product descriptions and on your website. So some of the business benefits of being a sustainable e-commerce seller is increased brand loyalty and you'll strengthen your consumer trust and increase their loyalty to your brand. And also make you more competitive in the market because this will help you differentiate, differentiate yourself from competitors and also align your business with the customer values of sustainability. So you do need to communicate your efforts in this regard. So you can communicate your efforts and achievements to consumers on your website, in your email newsletters, on your social media pages, and in your product descriptions online. Do this consistently and regularly, and it will help build a trust and encourage them to support your business even more. And you can evaluate and adjust and regularly assess your supply chain and your operation methods to see what can be made more uh, sustainable over time. Because as we know, this is a sh rapidly evolving concern in society. So in six months or in 12 months, what you might be doing today, there might be a better or more sustainable approach. So always be on the lookout for that. An example of a company that has profited very much from being sustainable is Patagonia the clothing company. Now, Patagonia ensures that all of its materials like organic cotton and recycled polyester are sourced responsibly and minimize environmental impact. This is a major part of their selling uh, campaign and their marketing campaign. 
They use fair trade practices and they pay a premium for products that are certified fair trade. So something you can also do to make your business more sustainable. And they also take measures to reduce their environmental impact and pollution and their carbon footprint. So just some ideas of how you can use this trend to help boost your business in 2024 and I believe in the years to come. Now, another key trend that I want to teach you about is AI in e-commerce, because AI, as we know, is coming into many areas of our lives and is also affecting e-commerce sales. Um, some of the main ways AI is helping is by analyzing customer data and enhancing customer satisfaction. So increasing the conversion rate by using AI is a key selling point to many of the platforms. And I'm going to talk about how they use AI. And so if you're going to use either of these four platforms here, you'll get a sense of how they're using AI to help you sell right now. And of course, these things will be, I'm sure, expanded upon and made more efficient in the future. So Shopify uses AI to personalize the product recommendations and the browsing and purchasing history for people shopping there. So if you're selling something in a category that they bought before, they're using a much more sophisticated AI to kind of predict what that customer wants, helping you get your product in front of them. And in addition to that, they're also helping the search functionality and improving it with AI, helping products come to the forefront of customer searches that the ones they're looking for. AI is being used at Etsy to improve search and discovery of products similar to Shopify, but it's also helping you as the seller manage your pricing. It's coming up with predictions and calculations far more sophisticated than things available in the past to help you understand and forecast pricing uh, for today and also into the future. And it can help you optimize your listings, everything from the product descriptions um, to help match up with the buyer search patterns and preferences. Facebook has invested a lot into AI in its platform. It uses AI to personalize the shopping experience and make product recommendations. And one thing I mentioned before is that because of its ownership of Instagram, if somebody sees a product in an image on Instagram, then Facebook AI can tie that in with a product for sale on Facebook shops. So it's pretty neat to be able to get referrals for products based on images that were shown to somebody else on Instagram. And Facebook is currently the only platform that can do this because they own both that shopping experience and that portal there, and also the image content that's being posted on Instagram. Amazon uses AI and large amount of customer data to provide product suggestions and is for you as the shopper, they help you forecast demand and manage your inventory. And I think this will become a key thing AI is able to do in the next couple of years is help you manage your price, forecast the demand and help you manage inventory. So you'll know what you need to be manufacturing or ordering from your suppliers to meet the needs of your customer. And AI is really giving a boost to our ability to do this. So the last part of the presentation is I'm gonna show you how to launch your store and maximize your profits. First, we'll talk about setting up your payment methods. Then we'll preview, test, and publish your online store. And then we'll talk about how you can follow up with an advisor in four to six weeks to get the most profit from your online store. Well, so the first thing we're gonna talk about are the payment methods. There's different ways you can accept credit card processing and they all come with a fee either to Visa, MasterCard or Discover or American Express or the four main ones. Generally, you'll pay between 1% and 10 cents per transaction up to 3% and 30 cents per transaction. There's several popular ways to accept credit card payments. The first one would be a merchant account and a payment gateway. So in this case, you would have a bank like Wells Fargo or Chase. Some small banks don't offer this, but they will put a credit card um, checkout page on your website, accept the credit card payment for you for the product sold, and then channel that money into your business bank account. 
The second way is a payment gateway package. This is a piece of software that you can install generally on your website. Some of you might be familiar with WordPress websites. Some of you might even have a WordPress website. Well, if you do, then WordPress has a good example of this. It's called WooCommerce. And WooCommerce is a payment gateway package that creates the whole shopping cart experience and the credit card processing pages for your website. You pay WooCommerce a small fee and you get that. So that's called a payment gateway package. And lastly is simplified credit card payment processing. So some e-commerce platforms and other services have built their own payment gateway. So a good example is Shopify. You can actually get a you know 0% credit card processing fee if you use Shopify's credit card processing. Um, so that can be nice, you know, and you are going to pay those fees in other places in Shopify. Shopify is not going to be losing money because they, they give this option, but um, it can make Shopify a lower cost option in some regards compared to its competitors. So depending on your unique situation, any one of these three options might be the best option for you to maximize your profits. It's very important that you'll preview and test before you publish your online store. So before you're gonna launch your store, whether it's your own website or you've set up one on Shopify, Etsy, or Amazon, here's some things to check. You first wanna check that your checkout process is working. So you can place a test order and refund yourself. Make sure any email notifications you've set up are coming through and that the refund process and the credit card billing process all worked fine. Make sure your buttons work and any links that you have, you might've had a typo in one or it links to the wrong page. So check every link and make sure that it's working well. And also go through your content, read through everything very, very closely and see if you've got anything with a spelling error, typo, a grammar error. It's a good opportunity to also to check all of your pictures to make sure again, none of them look blurry or pixelated and they all have a consistent lighting and a professional look to them. Lastly, I know it's a lot of information to take in and learn, and it's going to be a good time to talk to an advisor after you've been running an e-commerce store for four or six weeks. So I would suggest you set up an appointment with your local SBDC or another professional e-commerce advisor who can help you analyze your data, because any of these platforms and even your own website, you'll be collecting data on how many people visited your pages, how long did they spend looking at your pages? How many of them, of course, bought your products? And at the end of the day, how much revenue and profit did you make? So it's a lot to take in. And if you're new to it, it can be kind of overwhelming with all of the data that's available. So I'd recommend you talk to somebody who has been through this before and can give you some advice. Um, talk about what your sales and revenues goals were for the first month and how did you do reaching them? What feedback did you receive from your customers? It can be either positive or negative. Also, what products sold the best and the worst? What new ideas did you come up with for future products to sell online? What have you learned from your competitors? So during the first month or two, it's critical that you're not haven't launched your store and then stopped paying attention to how it's doing and what your competitors are doing and online trends. Always be researching and learning about trends and your competitors to see what new things you can think of and what you're going to try to do differently in month two plus to really help you maximize the profits of your online store. So I thank you all for your attendance. I hope this was valuable information. I'm now happy to take your questions in the time we have left. And if you have to go and can't stick around, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, at the moment, we only have one question. Um, the question is, I'm wondering if there's recommendations for fundraising or services instead of products. And this came on early on. <clears throat> well, so recommendations for fundraising or selling services, I think those they sound like two different things to me. If you're wanting to fundraise, there are some platforms now, again, I don't really cover them in depth here, or I'm not also an expert on them, but things like Kickstarter or GoFundMe come to mind as platforms I've seen used to, to raise funds. And if you're selling services, it would be helpful to know a little bit more what type of service. But as I mentioned before, if your service is something like a, 
a hair salon or some building where the people come in physically and get your service, you can have a very basic website that this is kind of called a brochure website. It can have your business name, some images, your address, open hours, and your contact information. There might be no need for you to take any credit card payments online, in which case that's what I consider a level one website or a very basic website. So um, give us more information if you'd like about the type of service and I might be able to give some more specific advice. Great. Um, next question, <clears throat> how do you maximize SEO? That's a whole topic all by itself, right? Yes, yeah, SEO <laughs> is a is a great question, and you know, maximizing SEO. One of the things I covered here was about the images. So having two large images makes your page load slowly, and the search engines can see that, and so they give you a bad SEO score. But there's a lot of other things to SEO, including the amount of text and the type of text you have on your web page. How applicable is that text to the search terms if somebody is typing into Google or into Facebook or even into Amazon, if you want your product page on any of these e-commerce sites to pop up? So yeah, it, it's a it's a big question. Um, I think we have some presentations coming up later this year where I do talk more about SEO. Uh, so if you can wait, then you can definitely sign up to those. But also you can probably watch some YouTube videos on maybe SEO basics if you're just looking to learn the basics or if there's a specific platform like Amazon or Shopify, you can look for some videos talking about those platforms because the SEO tactics are slightly different if you're trying to get your Amazon page or your Shopify page to come up uh, versus if you have your own website and you're looking for SEO help on your own website. So I would um, encourage you to, to look fo in a focused way and really what um, platform you're gonna be selling on. Thanks. Um, okay, so this next question, I'm going <clears> to <throat> read it as I think it should be written and then let you address it. Um, I need to, I think it's harvest my interactions with students and transfer the architecture to a real-time interactive deliverable mode. What technology does that? Um, that's a great question, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think the question is a, is a bit unclear. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably also, I think, a little bit outside of the scope of the e-commerce um, so presentation today. I'm not sure that it would be interesting to other people. I think that go ahead and email us at help at virginiasbdc.org. Um, please give us more details if you can. And, um, you know, I can take a look at that in more in more length and hopefully give you some sort of an answer. Great. Thank you. Um, I've been researching online platforms. Just curious why you didn't mention Square. Square is generally it's a payment processing uh, platform first and foremost. So it's kind of like PayPal where they do the payment processing. Uh, recently, they have tacked on a feature that let you build a simple e-commerce website, very much like Shopify. Uh, I don't mention them because they're not one of the major players here. And in fact, e-commerce was not their primary service. So, you know, if if you're gonna if you want to do something like that, I think uh, Shopify it might be a better option in many ways. Um, they have more features. They're bigger. Um, yeah, but I think in many ways they're very similar to Square. So if you're gonna if you're considering that method, uh, Square, I'd also look into Shopify. Um, how can I use a store that is selling equipment to draw people in on the website with the goal to attract attention to our service side? Um, I do not intend to ship. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you're selling equipment. I'm not sure what type. I thought maybe like a gym equipment popped in my mind, but if you're if you're trying to sell products, but with the goal of having people to come into your physical store, it sounds like. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. If you're not going to ship, then you're, the only way to sell your products would be if they pick them up physically, maybe because they're so big. Um, in that case, you can, you know, if you're in a major metropolitan area like DC, I think you'll have enough market. But if you're in a smaller community, there might not be enough market for people to come physically to pick up your goods. So yeah, what I'd recommend, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm the... Um, attendee elaborated. Um, sure. They're one of the few places who sell fencing equipment. Oh, like swords, fencing, as opposed to fencing for okay. yards. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fencing equipment. Um, well, I'm not sure why you couldn't ship fencing equipment. It seems like it might be small enough, but if you don't want to ship it, then yeah, you can set up, I would set up a website. So, you know, yourbusiness.com. I would list your products. I would have the prices. 
but um, you can have in the shipping options, you can say, you know, shipping not available, local pickup only. You can have the address, you can have the hours of operation right there. They can still buy and pay for the products with a credit card with the knowledge that they have to come pick them up in person. So that's that's completely feasible. I would, I think, because fencing equipment, I don't think it'll be a great fit for a Shopify or an Etsy. So I would probably build your own website, your own .com to host that product and that shipping information. Um, so this attendee asks, is e-commerce growing? It seems like such a crowded field. It is growing. I don't have stats off the top of my head, but it's growing every year and it has been for at least 10 years. We've seen it uh, explode with the pandemic and a lot of you know brick and mortar shops closed or had to shift online to selling. Um, so it is growing for sure. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. Though I think one trend that might slow down its growth is just the negative environmental impact of shipping so much, right? So when people are trying to source locally, um, it's more sustainable. And so obviously we all realize that shipping across the US or across the globe is not a good environmental practice. So that will probably slow down e-commerce a bit. So again, that's why I have the information about being sustainable because it's such an important aspect to your e-commerce business now. You don't want to be seen as a contributor to global warming or anything or climate change. You want to be seen as a, a business that's aware and is kind of following the current trends because that's what your target market is looking for, for the most part. Uh, depends on your industry, but I think most consumers are looking for an environmental friendly business now. So um, yeah, you can keep on shipping through e-commerce, but I think focusing on those aspects of your business and messaging those is going to be important. Um, so, okay, next question. If I were to utilize Shopify, would I also create a company website as well? I'm still having a hard time understanding how Shopify integrates, as in people don't go to Shopify, they go to the company website, and then they go on to say they're not sure they're making sense in this question, but um, hmm. maybe you can elaborate. Or Yeah, so your you company, your company website, which would be yourbusiness.com, it gives your company and your brand just a more uh, polished reputation. You know, if you think about buying something from somebody on Shopify, it's a different experience than buying something from a brand that has a logo and messaging and a tagline that kind of resonates with your target market. So you can build that on your own website and you can market to your target audience much better on your website than on Shopify. If you want to use them both together and many businesses do, you can have your website as kind of your home on the internet with the you know, about us page and maybe pictures of the employees, right? Really make it a personal about your business and your um and your you know marketing prop your value proposition to your customer. But then you can sell your products on Shopify if you want Shopify to handle your credit card payment processing for you. You can also sell your products on your website and then also have a Shopify page with your products if you'd like. Um, some businesses will have multiple e-commerce sites listing their products as well as their main website. So you could do that with your website and Etsy. You could do that with your website and Amazon because places like Etsy and Amazon, not so much Shopify, but Etsy and Amazon um, and Facebook shops, they're gonna be portals or funnels where new customers can find out about you. So in a very competitive space of, of selling online, the more places your products are listed where your customers can find them, the more products you're gonna sell. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so the next person is looking for your feedback on the following. Um, Amazon takes 50% of sales if you use their warehouse shipping services instead of shipping uh, myself. And it's challenging to meet prime shipping speed if you don't use their shipping services. So they're just wondering if you have any feedback on that or thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I know that the fees can be high and I, I believe Amazon keeps kind of raising the fees to sellers every year. Um, you know, I still know that it works for a lot of businesses and they prefer to pay the fees versus having to handle the shipping and all that time and the overhead themselves. I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to take work. It's either going to take work for you to box and ship or it's going to take money to have Amazon do that. So um, yeah, I think it's a, you know, it's a trade-off, but I think Amazon is growing still and is the largest e-commerce platform because they've managed to find some sort of a good middle ground 
um, there. But if it's not working for you, then I would encourage you to look at some of those other options we talked about. Thank you. Um, okay, do we have any other questions? We have a, about 20 more minutes so we can pick Cameron's brain. Um, so we'll give a moment, see if anyone has another question to pop in. Otherwise, in the meantime, Cameron, do you have any last thoughts before I close us out? Um, well, I just appreciate everybody's participation and the great questions. Hopefully we're able to get to them. If not, you know, if they're too long to be handled today, email us. And, you know, the SBDC has a lot of advisors, not just in e-commerce, but in other ways that can help your business. So feel free to, to reach out and we'll get you in touch with the right person who can answer your questions. Fabulous. Um, we do have another question that popped in. Um, what would be the best place to start with zero experience and a very small budget? <laughs> I think it depends on what your product is. If you want to let us know, at least generally speaking, what you're doing and what you're selling, that'll help guide guide you a little bit more. So we'll, we'll wait a minute for that. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read this one since we have the time. Um, do you have any recommendations on accounting software? I'm not sure that this really plays in here, but maybe it does. So I'll let you address that if you want to. Uh, yeah, uh, a great question. But no, I'm not the expert on accounting software. Um, I know that there will be people in the SBDC network who do that professionally, so they'll be able to help you out. Agree. Um, is Next question, is eBay still reliable? Yeah, eBay, some people ask me why I don't include eBay on my list here. And it's a great question. I do feel like eBay, if I had a sixth option, would probably be there. I feel like they're kind of number six. They work well for some businesses, but not all businesses. Um, there's still an option. I think it's still a very relevant platform. It hasn't grown as much as Amazon, Shopify, or Etsy, or Facebook at all, but they're still there. So th there's a niche there. And if you're selling more of a one-off like antiques or handmade goods, you can still sell your products there for sure. I just feel like it's um, it has fewer users than these five. And therefore, if you're relying on your e-commerce platform to be a funnel of customers, eBay, yeah, it's just not as big. So it won't be as good for that. But some businesses still find it very useful. Um, if you were starting a jewelry business and they do elaborate a ministry focused on celebrating a royal status of God's kingdom. So we're looking at a religious based jewelry. What platforms would you use? So jewelry typically sells well on Etsy. Um, because that's really meant for a like, handmade and handcraft things, especially, you know, if they're made in a factory and they're, you know, a thousand, they're all identical. Etsy's not your place, maybe Amazon, but if they're more unique one-off items, handmade at a slightly higher price point, Etsy would be good. And also Amazon handmade would be good. So I would apply there and start that application process. Do we have any other questions? Okay, nothing else is popping in. Oh, let's see. Um, linked to the question of which option of e-commerce platform to use for a person who is new to e-commerce and low budget. Um, if my product is bed sheets, duvets, bedding, um, what would you recommend? So it's kind of, again, if it's a more of a hand craft type of item than Etsy would be good, even Amazon handmade. Um, if it's more of a mass produced thing from a factory, then you'd probably be looking at Amazon is very common to sell those types of products. Of course, your own website in all these cases, your own website should be a place where these products are, are listed. Like I said, because you can have a better brand image online and sell them for a higher price point. If you decide to sell them directly through your website, typically. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read this next question and I can answer it. Um, if we're just starting our site e-commerce site, <clears throat> um, can we reach out to SBDC to work with someone to help us out? And absolutely. Just email help at virginiasbdc.org. Um, let us know your zip code where your business is located and we'll get you correct um, connected with the correct center um, for an advisor to help you. Um, okay, and we do have another question. Does Amazon charge 50% sales share on a single sale or one-time service fee? So based on my information, I can quickly go back to that slide. Amazon charges um, a fee that is, 
either a $40 a month to have your account or $1 per item, plus the fulfillment fee of two to $6. So if you're selling an item that's, you know, um, $12, then the $6 fulfillment fee is, is 50%, right? Um, so yeah, I think it depends on how much that item is being sold for, where the 50% comes in, but these are the fees that are listed on Amazon's website. Um, so let's see, um, this person is asking about Poshmark, OfferUp, and was it Macari? Macari, and some of the others, any thoughts on any, I guess, others that you haven't mentioned? Um, no, no, I'm actually not familiar with those. So, okay. yeah. Okay, we still have 15 minutes. So if there's any other questions, we are here. <laughs> Okay, it's looking like we're about finished. So thank you, Cameron. Um, as always, lots of fabulous information. Um, oh, we had another question. Um, do you recommend starting as an individual seller or a business on the platforms? Well, I would, I mean, it's kind of a legal question, but I'd always say start with a business entity, like an LLC to protect yourself from liability. So if you sold a product that ended up hurting somebody, but you sold it directly under your own name and they wanted to sue, then you know um, they could sue you and all of your assets. But if you create an LLC for $100, it's very cheap, and you sell under the LLC, your personal assets are all protected, of course, and um, then only what the company owns could be um, sued for. So, you know, with my quick legal advice, that's that's kind of where I see it. I think that always selling under a business is smart. I mean, it's a small investment around $100. Um, now, you know, however, your business might have some more um, requirements. Every industry kind of could be a little different. So I would encourage you to speak to a legal advisor before you make that decision final. Um, start with somebody at the SBDC. And if they can't answer it directly, they can, I'm sure, point you to a legal expert who could um, help you more. Fabulous. Okay. Anything else? Um, that wasn't for you, Cameron. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions for us? I think you provided a lot of fabulous information. These slides are just extremely helpful. Um, okay. I am going to wrap us up then so everyone can move on with their day. Um, let's see. Cameron, thank you so much again. And thank everyone for attending. You will receive an email with a link to the recording and to the slides. If you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These webinars and other um, SBD resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. We hope to see you at our next session. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.